And we're live. Hello, welcome back to Tuesday Training. I'm gonna turn off this other video real quick so you don't hear two of me, one is plenty. Welcome, welcome practitioners to Tuesday Training. Hello, hi Anna, it's nice to see you. Lori's here too already, great. So welcome, here we are, Practitioner Tuesday Training. It's one of my favorite times of the week. I love being here. Welcome, welcome. We have a solid hour of talking client work, anatomy, functional anatomy, professional development, if that's what comes up. Um, muscles has been the focus for the last few months and how we use them and what we do with them. And uh, we're also going to have plenty of time today for Q&A. So i um, preparing you right ahead of time now to have your cues in queue. Yeah, and I was like, good, I got some. I had a feeling you guys were gonna have some questions today. That's why we're that's why we're gonna roll it out with some QA this week. So for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, so welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, we're gonna spend an hour together and um anything that you would like support on with the client work that you do as a manual or a movement practitioner, or if you're both, that's also cool. Uh, I am Gina Schatz, I'm hosting you for the next hour. And um, I'm also both a manual and movement practitioner. I don't really do either one of those right now because I do the shots method, which is what I developed while I was working clinically, looking for that answer. You know how we're all like looking for the, how do I, what do I do when, how do I, which one do I use, what tool do I use? Yeah, so tools are great and a method's better. <laughs> that sounds so cheeky, but it's actually how I feel and it's how I created results. So. Um, I am here to talk to you about any of the tools that you use for sure. I love tools um, and also how to put those tools together in a method so that you can create results. So the shots method works with the anatomy, the way the body's designed, gets to the source of the problem and eradicates the pain and it works, which is super freaking cool. So for those of you who've been here over and over again with me, I love it. I feel like it's our special time. So thanks for being here. And I know there's a whole gaggle of you guys that are watching on the replays because you keep telling me that. So hi, for those of you on the replay, if you are here on the replay, put a little thumbs up in the chat or something and let me know that you're here so that I can pour some energy in your direction, which I would uh, love to do. Um, okay, so here we are, Tuesday training. Anything's, anything's a go, right? Anything's a go on Tuesday training. Um, for those of you who enjoyed the breakdown last week or who didn't hear the breakdown last week, you also hear me talk about the mastery practitioner track a lot, especially when we start getting into solving problems, because that's the program that I outline how to solve the problems in. So um, I don't want you to feel like you're excluded from the conversation by, by any means. There's just a whole host of information that we do have in that program that some of us here. Anna and Lori um, both have access to already. So um, everybody's welcome in the conversation and some of the conversation happens in a different program. That said, we can still solve a lot of stuff here on a Tuesday, even if we're not already joining each other in the mastery practitioner track yet. <laughs> All right, loves. So in the last few weeks, uh, we talked about the body's design. And I always start with the body's design. We start with the body's design when I'm teaching inside the mastery track, outside the mastery track, to my clients, to non-clients, to family members, because it's the thing. It's the thing. When we know how the body's designed and we understand the body's design in function and parts, then our goal is to return it back to the design and utilize the design optimally, and then there's no pain. Sounds super simple in concept, and it is. And our work then is to learn all the anatomy and to be able to spot when things go wrong and have a way to return it back. So our work is uh, complex, right? Which is why we're experts and do what we do. But we're always gonna start with the body's design because that's where the answers are. So we've spent a couple weeks on that. We talked about joint action and muscles that do the joint action and muscles that allow the joint action to happen and the muscles that support the joint action to happen. And then we talked about when that might go wrong and it's back to how the body's designed and how the bones are designed to be in relationship to each other and muscles move those bones. So now we're back to the muscles that do the action that hold the alignment while the joint action is occurring. And it starts to stack a bit, and I get that. And once you have that, it's just, that's memorization. 
it's, it's understanding and comprehension around memorization. Once we get into the land of when things go wrong, it's a crapshoot. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not really kidding, actually. It's just that there is no rote memorization for when things go awry. What we get to use then is something I lovingly refer to as strategic thinking to think our way out of the spider web. Notice my Halloween reference to think ourselves out of the spider web and back to the body's design. Okay. And that does take a minute for sure. Does It takes a minute. We spend a lot of time on that in the mastery track and we're just diving in there now. So it's a perfect time to line up Tuesday training with the track that we're also in, in the mastery track because like minds coming together, always solve problems in a bigger, greater way. So with that, I would love to ask you, Lori and Anna, and anybody else who's also here to um, share with me where in that lineup so far do things start to feel gray or fuzzy? Is it at the joint action again? Is it at the muscles? Is it the alignment with the muscles? Go ahead, Anna. You got it? Got something? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, a couple of, of things uh, for me, and that is when um, when the lever system is not working well, in other words, when the muscle that's supposed to contract is not fully contracting, when its opposite muscle is not fully lengthening, um, does that actually cause stress to the joint, to the actual joint? Or is it just stress to the muscle? Like how, how big is the implication of, mm -hmm. of that imbalance which I think most of us must have because, you know, we, we don't work perfectly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that's my question. Is it actual, you know, the, the acetabulum, you know, and, and the head of the femur, like, I, like how much stress, you know, that, that's my, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really great question. What's drawing the question for you, Anna? Because I'm really thinking about, um, you know, the imbalance in 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 the the main the contracting muscle and the lengthening muscle mm -hmm. and um you know i i take it back always to my own body because it's the only way i can teach from and um uh, yeah so you know when things go wrong continually in my body always same sort of area and I think, you know, it's not just coming from one area. It has to come from a whole bunch of areas. But is it possible that the actual joint, you know, the cartilage in the joint or the amount of synovial fluid or, um, yeah, I'm just curious whether uh, the imbalance in muscles or in the lever system in particular um where's the joint and then does that contribute also to the overall problem oh does it contribute to the overall problem so that's really what's drawing you to question that the pressure on the joint so um maybe first let me just acknowledge though you got lever system down girl i like it so good yeah so for those who have not been in our conversation about lever system, it's the it's the way the body's designed to create joint action. On one side of the joint, there's a contracting muscle. On the other side of the joint, there's a lengthening muscle. It's super simpl simplified. And then in the more robust version of how the brain is wired to move muscles, it's reciprocal inhibition where there's more muscles involved in that game. Hey, Valerie, welcome in as Lori. I like it. I know whose link you used to get here today. I like it. <laughs> um, so loving that, Anna, it's great. And it is, um, I, I really, I really shy away from the word. It depends and it depends. So overall, let me just say this in answer to your question. I am not concerned when I'm working clinically in the top three things that I think about. I am not concerned about whether there's a joint change, meaning bones and cartilage and synovial fluid. I'm just not. Because if I'm worried about 
what's resulted from the imbalance, I'm focused on the symptoms of the imbalance instead of restoring the imbalance so there will be no symptoms. So it takes me a long time before I start considering, is there joint structural changes here? So I just wanna just like in context, that's really why I'm like, well, why are you asking? Because it doesn't come up for me in top three. I love the question though, but that's why, that's why I was pausing. And it's the same idea with the work of Paul Greeley that we learned. And we have this in Inspired Beyond Anatomy 1 and Inspired Beyond Anatomy Level 2, which are courses inside our academy that anyone is welcome to participate in. You do not have to be in the mastery program to take CE courses. And in those courses, we talk about bone shapes at joints, right? And when I first heard about Paul Greeley's work, it was described to me as bone on bone. Like Paul really decided that there was bone on bone. And, you know, I really love bringing this up to practitioners because we get to be really thoughtful about the way we language and message the body's design. Bone on bone is not what Paul really said. <laughs> but what he did share with us was that bony endpoints are different person to person. And you know that if you've ever touched anyone's elbow or their spine, right? If you're if you're even not even a manual practitioner and you're just poking around on bony landmarks, they feel different body to body. We have different um, edges, if you will, but we have the same parts. We have the same parts. So what Paul Grilly shared with us was that there are times, specifically like ball and socket joints, um, and hi Pauline, I'm glad you're here where the acetabulum, as you mentioned, Anna, could be smaller in a radius than someone else's, which might have a wider diameter. And the head of the femur might be broader at the top or narrower at the top in different bodies. We all have the same acetabulum, we all have the same head of the femur, but they could be different, um, hi, there could be different uh, sizes. And so, if we have a particularly narrower radius on the acetabulum and a wider head of the femur, there's not as much movement available in that ball and socket joint as there would be in someone who has a wider diameter in the acetabulum and maybe a narrower head of the femur, lots of room to move. The reason I'm bringing this up, Anna, for your question is just like when we talk about bone sizes, like the work that Paul Grilly has shared with us, I still say, consider that last, even though it's real. 100% I'm a buy-in on Paul Greeley's work. I've shown you guys pictures of it. Yes, thank you for someone else doing cadaver studies. So I don't have to, cause I like doing other stuff first, but I really wanna know what the cadavers have to say, right? So like, hallelujah, he did it for us and took images and we've got all this information. And again, because I can't do anything about the way someone's bones are shaped, I'm not going to spend my airtime on that because where I spend my airtime is where can I affect change? And I can always affect change on muscles and I can often create something in other soft tissue, tendons, ligaments, nerves, blood, but I can't do anything about bones. They're, they are, they're organic. They're, they're growing and living and breathing entities, but they're fixed in their size. Like, I'm not going to change the size of someone's acetabulum. It's not going to happen. And I'm also not going to jump to that as a reason for the restriction and miss something that I might have been able to affect. So that's like fourth on my list to even consider like, huh, maybe this is a bony end mark thing. And I'll tell you this, not only has this always been my uh, mode of operating clinically, um, and I believe it but I also was positive that in my own body, I had a bone size difference in one hip and not the other, which didn't really make sense to me, but everything I tried in my own body kept leading me to, it's not moving, it's not moving, this is how it is, this is fixed, it's not moving, this is how it is, it's not moving, this is how it is. Which you'd think then is like bones, like bones aren't gonna let it happen, right? It's not, if it could change, it would be muscles, tendons, ligaments, some soft tissue that's changeable. For years, I thought it's got to be a bony landmark. It's got to be a bony landmark. It's got to be about bone formation. And I was wrong. After 20 years, I was wrong. Guess what was needed? My own method. <laughs> ah! 
So it's really hard to work on yourself. So just know that. So if you're all self-diagnosing, which we all like to do as body workers, just know you are in the weeds. So Anna, you said you like to use it in your own body, just like me and diagnosing yourself. Don't, don't kid yourself into thinking you got it right. Cause you just don't, I didn't. Right. But when one of us in our community who is trained in the method had an outside look at my body and was working with me, all of a sudden the hips now different after 20 years. Wow. What the shit? So I was even taking myself out of the, I can do something about this. This has got to be just how it is. And look at all that time I wasted in my own physical experience because I didn't have an outsider's expert view looking in at my own body. And I was still churning around with, well, maybe it's bones, maybe it's bones, maybe it's not changeable, maybe it's fixed, maybe it's fixed. So my point is, if it's real, bony landmarks and joint changes are real, for sure. And it's way down on the list of considerations. Okay. The only time it has a little bit more um, uh, attention, if you will, in the treatment setting is if someone is uh, actively uh, experiencing osteoarthritis, like diagnosable, not self-diagnosed, diagnosable, because that means that there are images that have shown actual structural changes at the end of bones, which doesn't really matter to the bone or to the person, except that the muscles attach there. And so now the relationship between the, the bony landmarks and the muscles becomes um, potentially distorted. And that just means we get to work more diligently to restore function, not use that as an excuse to say there isn't function available. So it's still the same process. It's just more attention, but it doesn't take us out of the game. Okay. Hi, Joan. Welcome. I'm glad you're here too. So Anna, does that um, answer your question? Uh, it, it does. I, I think, um, you know, my thing was not necessarily to focus on that because I completely understand and agree with what you're saying that, you know, that's not something we can change other than understanding perhaps, you know, hypermobility or, or, mm. or you know, that limitations in mobility. But I yeah. was just wondering whether, you know, there is over time with this imbalance in that joint, whether there was some stress that put that's put on that joint in, in some way and therefore, you know, because there's so much attachment. But but you know, I, I, I do understand. Yeah, I was just curious whether continued imbalance um potentially led to um I, I don't want to say weakening of the joint, but no, I, I was just curious. Um, no, you're, yeah, you're onto something and you're, and I like the way you're, I like where you're going with the thought and the answer overall is yes. And um, our, res our, our approach to that is still back to return it to how it's designed. So if we know optimal alignment in every joint and we know the muscles that hold that alignment, we're still resolving the problem. So we don't really need to focus on, well, with, in the absence of alignment and with this muscle working that way, what would be the effect of the connective tissue? Don't even spend time thinking about that. Just get them back to alignment. <laughs> we don't want any more changes. And, and so I'll just elaborate a little bit more. Um, in um, Chorn labrums, for example, that's classic alignment, classic alignment. And it is a very a painful injury and it's specifically joint alignment related unless it's um, blunt impact trauma, right? Welcome Gary, I'm glad you're here. So um, if we just look for, I'm just gonna hold them separate for a second because it's spooky Halloween. <laughs> um, Murph looks like he's spooky all the time though. Look at that alignment. Guy's got permanent torticles and he's missing a hand for God's sake. You just gonna get your act together. Can't even make eye contact with him. His head's so crazy. So. Back to the hips. Okay, so ball and socket, ball and socket, cool. We know, remember my hand position before as I was showing you the diameter of the acetabulum and the dense, the um, width of the uh, head of the femur that fits up in there, ball and socket, right. So there is a glide and lots of connective tissue that we don't really focus on in, in depth, in, um, in our academy or in the shots method, because we don't need to address the symptoms 
we need to restore the design and function. Okay. But we do know that the body parts say that there's, you know, connective tissue in there that allows this joint to do what it does. We focus on the muscles because the muscles are doing the work, but of course there's pieces parts in there for sure. And here's what we need to know about that. If the ball and socket are designed in a way where there's lots of movement available to them, that's not just the joint movement, but just like, just like this kind of movement, it's not necessarily joint movement. It's just, it's, it's looseness, if you will. And it's just designed. So we don't really want to call it loose because then we get confused with muscles. But if there is a size differential that allows for more um, freedom in that joint, not from muscles, but from design, then what can end up happening is that when we do create a joint action with this joint not aligned, and then we create a joint action and even add more pressure or torque with that action, which would be normal, right? There's torque involved when we're walking, for example, but it's there by design if you're optimally in that pattern of gait. But if you're not optimally aligned and there's torque and movement, what can end up happening is imagine like a spatula on the side of a bowl where there's like rubbing and rubbing that's a little it's a it's more scraping to get the end of the cake dough out of the bowl than there would be when you're just stirring the cake mixture right and that kind of rubbing and grinding can can be too much for those tissues for sure and over time yeah the bowl's going to be clean on the edges and so is the joint and <laughs> I mean clean scooped out of whatever is meant to be there as a cushion and I'm way over dramatizing that but I'm just trying to give you that visual like yeah we don't want things rubbing and grinding where they're not meant to, where they're meant to be sliding we don't want them grinding with torque when they're meant to be eased in movement okay and that is an alignment issue though it's not a labrum issue. It's an alignment of those two bones at that joint. They're the ones that rubbed on the labrum. The labrum's not the problem. The labrum screamed out of, you know, torture <laughs> and abuse. But that the labrum's not the problem. The alignment at that joint and the function on top of that alignment is what caused the labrum to have a problem. Which is why, again, we don't really focus on the labrum. We're like, is the joint aligned? Is it aligned optimally? And is, is the joint functioning the way it's designed? Are the muscles who are supposed to do the job doing their job equally on both sides of that lever? Both sides of that lever, meaning on the front and the back, if this guy's not moving with as much power as this guy, then this bone could potentially move in that joint. And now we're back to the same issue. I don't need to worry about what, what the result is of that. I just need to fix that alignment and that function. Okay. Is that good? Is that full? Are you fully or not? You got it? Okay, great. I have lots more questions. I'm going to, I'm going to let, let other people um, weigh in on questions. And if there aren't any, then I hope it's okay if I jump back in. Of course. I love questions. I'm, I love being on the hot seat. Ha well, uh, who came in? Nan, welcome in. Nan, I'm glad you're here today. Yeah, I'm happy to be on the hot seat. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, Hoping that you got, you love the topic. We love the topic too, Nan. I could talk shop with you guys all day long. I could talk shop with you all day long. So are there any other questions um, related to what we're talking about or maybe something that you're working on with a client? Um, your niece just had surgery. Okay, what kind of surgery? Do you want to talk about it? Does anyone have any um, questions that you want me to answer? You guys don't get a whole lot of opportunity to put me on the hot seat. I think you should take advantage of it. Put me on the hot seat. By the way, it's not that hot. I actually love it. Any other questions, Lori? Yeah, I'm not even, I'm, I don't even, I'm like that, blah, 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 right? Anna and I are like, like this whole time I'm trying to formulate my questions succinctly because I feel like I'm squirreling a little bit with this client, even though I'm, I mean, if I just go back to alignment, strength and function and joint action, then I'm not, then I'm not yeah. squirreling, but then I've been seeing him for a while and we've been working on repatterning mm -hmm. and I feel, and it's great. Like it's, it's shifted his life. It's shifted his being. He's got, he's a client that has all kinds of hardware in his body. And I'm not like, I'm not getting all caught up in that. He's got a curve in his spine. He's, 
there's so much I've seen x-ray, like there's all kinds of stuff going on. And I'm like, okay, let me just noted. Can I pause you right there? And just yeah. like something that I heard you say that you might not have even registered. And if hmm. you did, everybody else gets to register it. So he's got all kinds of hardware and a curve in his spine and a big history. And already the work that you're doing, you said has been changing his life mm -hmm. because he told you that it's been changing his life. Yes. So I just want to highlight that for all of us. When you're working with complex client case studies, you don't have to get complex. Return uh, them to how they're designed and it, and it is right. life altering. Those are his words. Right. Even yeah. with the hardware, even with, even with, even with. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Nan, I saw your note that your niece had labrum surgery. Awesome. So what we've talked about last week was what caused the labrum to need to have surgery because that still gets to be addressed. That doesn't get addressed on this on the operating table. Okay. So Lori, go for it. So, so you know about this client, the work that you've done has supported him. You mm -hmm. went to alignment strength function, which I love. Alignment strength function is a formula that I teach readily. It's in our functional anatomy masterclass. It's a super short class, highly effective. And it's again about the design. Great. So you're there right now. You're not squirreling on his stuff. You know, the work you've done is effective. Right. You're following alignment strength function. Did that get you out of the squirrel? Um, kind of what? Okay. It did get me out of it. Okay. So I want what? Hmm, I'm trying to even think what I'm squirreling about. It's probably this idea that he comes to me a couple times a week because he sees value in it. Part of it, I think, is accountability. He shared that with me. He's like, no, I come because it's accountable. I want to make sure I'm doing it right. I want to make sure that my yeah. alignment's right. Like, that's what you're here. I'm here to support him with. Yeah. And, yep, I do all of that. And I also would like to get him to next level, which is, yeah, <laughs> like, yes. Uh, which is um he's got a, get his upper trap is real it's like on lockdown and we talked about was it locked did we talk about lockdown last week gina was that somewhere else i anyway of a muscle um we and what to do about it it's in it's trigger it's trigger yes that was it yeah we did talk about but not here anyway Okay, so you want to get him to the next level. What's next level for him? Um, next level for him would be we're so close. Is this? Thing is, Why? Why is that the next level for him? Um, because that's the the part of his spine that is not aligned. Is his sacrum balanced? Um, not all the time. Like we've been working on that the past two times and okay, he'll come in misaligned and then we'll get him aligned and he'll come in again misaligned and then we'll get him aligned okay cool so that's his next level so you're oh, further holding the alignment of the sacrum yeah 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 so you're further along and so some of us here don't yet have this information but you're asking about next level and in your next level you allowed yourself to squirrel i did I went, it, it, he's not, yeah, because you've got to align the sacrum first and have it hold before anything else. I think I also, I was squirreling a little bit around adding strength to a misaligned frame and, you know, that whole, um, am I doing damage? And <laughs> I squirreled everywhere. <laughs> okay. So that's yeah. why I interrupted you at the beginning to yeah. just remind you of like, it's working. Stay it's focused, working. follow the formula, do what you know needs to be done first and then next. Okay. And so we'll pause you there and you got, and you almost forgot your question for a second. And then when left to go free floating back into your question, you <laughs> scrolled your yourself. So just <laughs> notice that like, thanks for, thanks for showing up authentically because you're not the only one. We all, we all do it. I did it in the past too, but it doesn't help. No, nope. you got to catch yourself in the squirrel guys, mm -hmm. loves, ladies, beings, you got to catch yourself in the squirreling. 
because you could absolutely keep yourself busy for lots of sessions over and over. It's my nickname, Nancy. I yeah, I hear you, sweetie. Like we all, right? Like mm-hmm. just you could keep yourself busy endlessly because this is an endless topic. Mm-hmm. And when you know, even subconsciously, that you're not targeting the issue and resolving it, you're not actually happy about those repeat visits mm-hmm. from your clients. You start to feel like a fraud or uneasy or nervous or less interested in them coming or however it shows up for you in your resistance. And mm-hmm. that's all stemming from your own squirreling. Yeah. Okay. So we get to be super grounded and clear so that whatever they bring, whatever tornado of an effect they bring in with their body, we're just like, okay, I got it. Mm-hmm. Right. Like a lower, calmer, very white. Oh, mm-hmm. I got, it. I got it. Right. You got to be in that energy so that all of the swirl isn't coming from you (laughs) because he already told you that he's in that, oh, she's got me. So if if you start adding in, I don't know, then he's going to be like, hey, maybe I got that wrong. Maybe she doesn't have me. Yeah. Well, I I squirrel ahead of time. And then when I'm with him, I'm like, whoop, drop in. (laughs) Like, Yeah. And so, right. So, but why so, squirrel? I guess the point is like, why squirrel either way? Like, yeah, that's why not an enjoyable anticipation of his visit? Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, like, why? There's no need to like just no squirrels. Right. It's like stressing, you know, before the greatest day of your life. You didn't enjoy all the preparation, so yeah, yeah. that doesn't work either. Go ahead, Anna. Um. So, I wanted to contribute something, Lori. Um, to what you're saying. And, you know, for me, and, and Gina's aware of this, I'm pretty clear that I actually contributed to pain um, that one of my clients experienced. <laughs> Gina's shaking her head, Anna. Are you still? I, I know, I know, I know. I'm not, her I'm, head. Not, I'm not swirling, like I'm not <laughs> going down the rabbit hole. But the point, Lori, that I wanted to share was, you know, uh, I felt, I mean, she comes twice a week. I felt, you know, I needed to move her forward. She didn't ask me to be moved right it was like you know am i giving her enough of a money's worth you know um but i knew i actually knew i needed to sit in strength more you know and and alignment and strength alignment and strength alignment and strength and i knew that and i decided yeah (laughs) i decided to give her something she didn't even ask for and that i knew she wasn't ready for and like blah so Mm -hmm. i i think trusting and i knew it like down deep inside, I actually knew it. So I think trusting, you know, ourselves and, and not going to those places of, you know, they need to be moved faster, more, right. um, you know, am I giving them their money's worth? And I'm going to shut up now because I know Gina has a lot to say about that. Yeah, because my blood pressure so- raises. No, just kidding. Yeah, Go ahead. No, my I- mind went there too, though, Anna. Like, oh, I want to move them further along quicker. And then I, I did pause and I'm like, and he's not ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And here's what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the, here's the jam. The way we work on the body is the same way we prepare ourselves to work on the body, which is what's underneath that for you. Mm -hmm. What's underneath the symptom. So the overgiving and the, am I giving enough? And Mm -hmm. why is he coming twice a week? Why is she coming twice a week? Do I have anything to offer? All of that underlying is your own stuff and it's your martyr story. Mm -hmm. It's your money type. So we haven't talked money types here on Tuesday training, but we do a lot of professional development in our mastery track. We've done a little bit of it in other master classes. You guys get to get underneath that. You get to get underneath your own value and your own worth and your own martyrdom before you do hurt someone. Right? Like you're not going to hurt anybody if you follow the body's design and if you stay in the step that you're in. But when your own fear of I might not be giving enough or do I have enough to give comes in and overrides your treatment plan, you will make silly mistakes. Don't do that. Get under it. Get under it. So we do money types in month one. We, I think we even do it in like week two or something of mastery. We do it really early on because it's insidious and it will just keep showing up. Like if, you know, if you're recognizing that your money type is is what's coming up for you here. Cool. Don't berate yourself about it. Just work with it, get under it, right? Like, 
oh yeah, there it is again. She told me in week two, it was going to happen. And here I am in month four facing, facing the spooky stuff again. Right. Yes. Because it's that it's, it will take you out. Both of you, Lori and Anna are wildly talented and have already created massive results for your clients. It's, it almost doesn't make sense to be having these conversations inside your own brain. Right. Like that's one of the reasons I'm really grateful you share it. So you can hear outside like, yeah, my outside story is not matching what my my inside dialogue is not matching what my outside results have been with these folks. Why am I in such disparity about this? Because the thing that, the, you know, the source, the source of your own, you know, whatever that is for you. So take some time there, maybe do some more journaling, maybe go back to that lesson and, you know, come to yourself again on that, maybe find five more balancing actions like we did in training and see if you can carve out the next free freedom space for you. Okay. And then follow the body's design <laughs> and you will be fine. I promise you. Okay. Good. Nan. I'm glad this is valuable for you. And yeah. And I don't know if you saw the chat, but, um, your, your share, your vulnerable share is very helpful. Nan put a comment in the chat for you. Okay, Lori, so what are you, what's your next step with your person then? Do you know your client? Um, well, first I get to measure him. See, to yeah. See what, yeah, yeah, to see what's up. And that will um, inform me where to go. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm, I'm pausing because I... Um, and we're so close with probable cause this week um, is that will also help to inform me what to next steps. Yeah, for sure. For right? sure. And I think that's where I feel a little um, not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Right. That's okay. I'm going to give you something that might support you and it's in either this or that. Um, so Nan, we're using uh, shots method measurements. So measurements I developed yeah. in our method. Um, so here's the jam for all of us. When your person comes in and they come in at, let's say a level seven discomfort mm -hmm. and you work your fanny off and they're really appreciative of the work that you did and their level of discomfort is still a six ish, maybe seven when they leave, you were squirreling all over the place and never even got close. It didn't affect change. And just right. be honest about that. You're like, Oh yeah, I, that was a waste. <laughs> I like I, I I offered nothing of value for you here except a really lovely hour of good conversation and focused attention. But relative to your pain and your symptoms, I didn't I missed it. And mm -hmm. just be honest about that and be like, wow, I missed it. What didn't I see? What didn't I look for? What questions didn't I ask? What design did I not follow? And just mm -hmm. be honest about that, right? Like nobody died. So like let off the noose off of your brain and your mm -hmm. heart. And just be open and curious about like, what did I miss? Be a, Allow yourselves to be in the learning, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other side of the coin is if your person comes in and they come in at a level seven discomfort and they leave in a two or three and you're like, wow, I nailed it. Yay. And they're high-fiving you and they're super grateful. And they're like, can I go running today? Because I feel so great. No, by the way, no. Um, but then they come back and it's returned. Mm -hmm. What that means is you are onto something Mm -hmm. And there's still something you missed. Mm -hmm. Not that you did something wrong or missed the boat altogether, but you were headed in the right direction and the body needed something more. So just go find out what that is. Let the body communicate with you because it has something to say. Okay. And those are not the same. So I want to give you, I want to just really emphasize this. If you do not move the needle on your person, you're not paying attention. Let's just, I'm just going to be candid about it. But if you did move the needle on your person and there's more to go on the same thing, it feels a little bit like Groundhog's Day, a little bit of rinse and repeat. There was more that was needed. You may not have more like Anna, right? Like you're not in, you're not complete with mastery yet. So you might not have all the things that you need to know about what's next. Maybe you do, but you get to keep looking. You get to keep looking. There's a one more option and that, which I'm not hearing here in, in your shares, but I just want to put it out there. If your person comes in at a level seven pain, they leave in a two or three, everything's good. They come back next week. That an initial seven pain is not there, but now they have a different pain somewhere else. That's a four. 
you just upset the apple cart and probably in a good way. If their case is complex, you're going to have residuals show up. It's what we talked about last week. Those are compensatory patterns. It's like peeling away the layer of an onion. This one's clear and in the garbage disposal, ready to go down or in the bowl of chili, ready to be cooked. There's another layer of an onion. You gotta still go, right? Those three scenarios are wildly different. So give yourselves an honest, um, you know, an honest reflection on what did I create here? Did I totally miss it? And I still get to go back and ask more questions of my teacher or my peers or something. Look back in a book. Because that's not the same as they came back and, oh, my God, what do I have to offer? They came back because you do have something to offer. Okay, let's see. Nan says, I like asking for a number before you start. Yep, that's always good. Could it be they have to do homework? Could be. Yep. And we get to figure out what the homework is. And the body moves pain, latent trigger points. The body moves pain, latent trigger points. Not sure what that means, uh, Nan. We did talk about trigger points last week for a bit. Uh, go ahead, Lori. You got something else? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about with this, the next thing. Oh, you're muted. I hit it by accident. Up until two weeks ago, like after we stabilized the sacrum, he wasn't fussing about neck pain, which is interesting. He was um, concerned that his neck was forward. He doesn't like the look of that. I don't like the look of it either, but he wasn't um, complaining like, oh, I got this big knot right here. So it just made me think of what you just said about the point three, that something, or he didn't just didn't mention it, but usually he mentions if something's going on, um, like stabilizing his sacrum shifted something so now it's like oh now my body's like responding here not in a bad way just like oh in a in a way that's um to pay attention does that make sense um not quite what are you thinking say it again um Can you make he, it a um, i have to i have to remember what he said about if he came in with neck pain Originally, you can't remember if he came in with neck pain. He, can't, he kind of came in with pain. It, his main complaint was lower back pain. Yeah, I was just going to ask the same thing that Nan said. What did What do your notes say? Did you take notes? It did. It's first session. Did he come in with neck pain or no? Let me find it. Nan's got your back. She's like, what about your session notes? I know, I gotta find it. So while you're doing that, Lori, uh, Nan, when you said when they come back and the pain has moved, it could, uh, something with trigger points, maybe trigger latent trigger points, um, could, yes. And we spoke last week about that. Trigger points are a symptom. So um, we want to look at what caused the trigger points initially. Because if you take away misalignment and dysfunction, there will be no trigger points. Yeah. So I, and I spent a lot of time studying trigger points. I love them. I love Janet Travell. I love what she did. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of the long way around. So uh, yeah, if you, if the body's working the way it's designed, there will be no trigger points. We didn't come with them. So Lori, did you find them? Did you find your notes? His, I'm looking back through his chief complaints were back pain. Okay. Lower pain, and then he, uh, a wrist his wrist was bothering him too. Okay. So why are we focused on neck right now? He does have neck pain. Cause now he has neck pain. Aha. Okay. So what do you know about the neck and the sacrum? Well, if your sacrum isn't, um, aligned, your upper body will, it's a, it will compensate for the misalignment of the sacrum. They're uh, linked. Close. What's that? They're they're linked together. They the linked. Pain is, yeah. Yep, they are linked. Yep. Nan's got your back again. Thanks. I love I, your fast chatter, Nan. I like it. I know. I'm like trying to like <laughs> watch and the, the chat kind of anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little tricky. So we talk about 
the four curves of the spine in inspired beyond anatomy level one. We talk mm. about it again in level two. We talk about it in functional anatomy masterclass. We talk about it in sacred sacrum. We talk about it. We talk about it. We talk mm. about it. Okay. Yes, they're linked. And what we get to know as we're problem solving is what is the link? What are the implications of the link between the two? And what are the implications of the link when they're not balanced? So how is the body designed? How does it work in that design? And what do I need to know when it's not working that way? It's the same approach that we talked about from the beginning here today. Okay. So we know that there's four curves of the spine, two concave and two convex. They all balance each other. If one of the concave curves is not concave in its optimal design, the other concave curve will be affected by that. And by oh, his lower back and his the lumbar and the cervical spine, or that's it. Yeah. Bingo. Then yeah. there's the other that's law, it. which is the cranial sacral law. Mm -hmm. So the cranium and the sacrum, different mm -hmm. law than the four curves of the body. So there's these two parallel laws that we know about these four curves and the significance of them and pain and alleviating pain. Cranial sacral law says that whatever the sacrum is doing, the cranium is also affected by that and vice versa. So what did you say you adjust on him, Lori, so far? His sacrum. Great. And now what is responding to that? His neck, upper traps. Yeah. Neck, head. Yep. Cranium and cervical spine. So mm -hmm. when you move the sacrum, the curve above it moves. Mm -hmm. sacral, sacral curve moves the lumbar curve. Mm -hmm. Sacral curve, a uh, lumbar curve and cervical curve are connected and cranium and sacrum are connected. Mm -hmm. So his body is saying to you what? I know it's a hard question. So I'm, I'm just getting you into some strategic thinking here. I know it's super hot seating in the hot seat today. It's okay. Um, not quite, man. It's yeah, not, yeah. What's his body saying? So we know the design of the four curves. We know cranial sacral law. Mm -hmm. You started on one, and now the other side, the other end. You started on one end, and the other end is giving you feet. What's the What's the body saying? To align the cervical spine. Finish the job. Finish the job. Finish the job. All four curves are part of the conversation we just right. had. Mm -hmm. One. Yep. Finish the job of balancing four curves, uh, balance the relationship between the cranium and the sacrum. Those might be two different things. They might be the same thing. You get to figure out your approach, but that's mm -hmm. what his body is saying. Right. His body, your body will always tell you where to go next. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get all like egoed about like, oh, I have to come up with a perfect treatment plan. No, you just have to be present and listen. The body will tell you, hey, over here, like, mm -hmm. cool, I'm going over there. Always, it will always tell you. Mm -hmm. And if we know the design of the body and we know how the body works in relationship to itself, then all we have to do is wait for the next hand raise. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is wait for the next feedback from the body. All we have to do is make a change, let it simmer, see what comes to the surface. It's perfect. So Nan says, so the treatment of this balance takes approximately how much time? It depends on what tools you're using, Nan. Um, for us, it's for, for, in the method, it's pretty quick because I'm, as you can tell, even in the way I talk, I'm pretty efficient. I don't like to screw around. Get her done. Gary, are migraines a result of those imbalances? Absolutely one of the causes, Gary. Yep, there's five different causes of migraines. Um, chemical, hormonal, uh, for example, are not structural related. Um, also, some cardiovascular stuff can be associated with migraines. Um, the only ones that we work with, of course, are structural. So yes, if, if C1 and C2 are out, for example, you could balance the four curves and always have migraines. So um, I work with, in partnership with, just on referral basis, there's like no money exchange, of course, but um, there is a upper cervical specialist in my area and every once in a while, when I balance the four curves and balance the cranium and sacrum and their head's still a little askew, like a lid on a jar, just like miss the thread kind of thing. I send them over to the upper cervical specialist to get that taken care of. And 
uh, those with migraines who've been living with them for a really long time sometimes think that like this is just the way it is. And we know that when the body is the least functionally in its structural state, when it's in alignment and being used the way it's designed, there will be no pain. So structural migraine headaches are not a life sentence. Nan says, I tell my clients, let me know when a place in the body says, hey, how about me? Love this. Is this a chiropractor? Um, I like the first part of what you said, Nan, because you're listening to the body. What's the second part? Is this a chiropractor? What does that mean? Um, we don't do chiropractic here. Um, good, Gary. I'm, I am hope that answered your question. I, I gave you a little bit more than what you asked. <laughs> I like the question. Um, okay, great. This is juicy and fun. Anything else on the table? We have just about seven yeah. more minutes. Go ahead, Anna. So I'm going to switch gears. Um, hold on one second. Uh, Anna, let me just answer Nan's questions. Uh, let me answer Nan's question. Uh, he's not neuro. He's called an upper cervical specialist. And my understanding is that they all do start as a chiropractor and then go on for extra training. And they're, uh, they're specialists, like they're very limited, um, but he doesn't do chiropractic work. He only does the upper cervical, kind of like how we are movement and manual practitioners before we become shots method practitioners, right? You have to have a base first before you move on to the specialty. Okay, awesome, Anna, you're up. Okay, so I'm a movement practitioner, as you know, um, and I use yoga as my modality. So um, what my what my ask is, um, you know, and I'm learning, I've, I've learned more than forever, uh, I, I've, I've applauded your method. I, I, I'll, you know, I, I stop people in the grocery store um, because despite <laughs> all of my training, you know, that I've had in the past, I mean, I've just had some huge gaps that are now being filled in. So thank you. But that's, but so when um, I have somebody in a low lunge, okay, mm -hmm. so that is, uh, you know, the back knee is down, the front knee is bent at 90 degrees. I don't care what, the hands are doing that's irrelevant mm -hmm. so where i get tripped up not tripped up i feel like i i just don't have enough knowledge so i go back to okay it was the psoas that took that hip joint to get the front leg you know forward and then it's the hamster we're talking front leg and then it's the hamstring that bent that knee mm -hmm. um but now I want them to stand up, uh -huh. okay? So I need them to push down on that foot and I need them to engage the glute um, uh -huh. and possibly the quad because I need them to straighten um, that leg. Uh -huh. the knee. But I thought the glute's only job was to take the um, leg you know, back behind, and then and then I end up squirreling. It's like, what, what, what am I cueing to? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a lever system question, Anna. It's lever system, and you're right there, and then you let, and then you dropped yourself because you you just told me all the muscles that are doing it, and the muscle that you want to eventually end up doing it, and you just left yourself hanging right there. But it's still a lever system question. So let's go back to what you know. When the hips flexed, is glute max lengthened, neutral, or shortened? It is uh, lengthened. Great. When the hip is um, in extension, standing, in a standing position, is glute max lengthened, neutral, or shortened? Neutral. Great. When the hips in hyperextension, is glute max lengthened, neutral, or shortened? Contracted, shortened. Great. So you know that, and you know the function of that muscle, and you're trying to figure out when glute max should do its job? In so that position, have, in that position with the, so, the low so you lunge. Have, you have your answer. You have your answer. So they're in a low lunge. Is the hip in flexion, neutral, or extension, hyperextension? Uh, the hip is in flexion. So what would the glute max be doing? It's lengthening. Great. When you have them go from that hip flexed position to standing, what joint action are you taking them to in that hip? New, uh, 
what you call extension. Yep, neutral or extension, exactly. So what would the fibers of glute max be then? Neutral. Great. To get them from flexion to neutral, do you think the uh, glute max is participating in bringing the leg back, in bringing the hip from flexion to extension? Well, I know it has to participate, but i that's the part I don't, I'm, I know it has so to so you just answer the question because you're getting yourself squirreled by just not following the align the uh, anatomy. So does it when when the hip is moving into hyperextension, is glute max participating? Yes, but I don't see where it's moving into hyperextension. Okay, so you said yes. So you're you're doing it again, Anna. So you said yes, glute max does contract to do that. Just know the know the design. And then take your question to the answer that of what you know, rather than spinning out in the question. But I don't see that it's going into hyperextension. That's my problem. Okay, cool. So they're in a low lunge. Let's go there then. Let's just follow the joint action. So they're in a low lunge. The front hip is in flexion, extension, or hyperextension? Flexion. Perfect. When you go to stand, what joint action are you in? Neutral. Great. So between flexion and neutral, does the hip extend? Do you mean hyperextends? No, I mean extend. Yes. Okay. So it goes to extension from flexion. Yes. Do you think that glute max only engages um, from neutral? Or do you think that it engages to create extension and hyperextension? Well, I, I can tell that it 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 does it has to engage to get us from flexion to neutral extension. It does okay. engage. Great. So it has to engage to do that. So where's the question for you? Because because it, my leg is not in hyperextension. So how did it how did it um, engage when you know I've been going around now you know telling everybody because I'm working on gait and walking uh, you know the glute max's sole job is to take your leg and you know hyperextension mm -hmm. and you know the glute amnesia and we're not doing that when we're walking and therefore blah 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 and therefore your hamstrings are okay. Okay, so just, just in the interest of time, I'm going to pause you for one second. Notice how quickly we like to squirrel into all kinds of, it's okay, it's okay. So the, diff, the distinction, Anna, the only distinction that I want you to take away from this is that in static joint action, it's a simpler lever. Ah. In transitions, you're in dynamic action. So there's overlaps of things happening. Right. So standing in neutral in Tadasana or mountain pose or just standing, whatever you want to call it, and taking your leg back and pausing is a static action. Walking is a dynamic action. There's it's fluid from one joint action transitioning into the next one. So there would be an overlap in the levers. So therefore, in low lunge to come to a stand, um, that's that's dynamic action so it's in a transition it's not a static correct which means that between hip flexion and hip extension there's other things that should be happening first perfect and it all has to be done in alignment so in that particular transition from low lunge to standing that front knee is probably not tracked over the second and third toes, which means it's irrelevant what glute max is doing because nothing can work optimally if the alignment's not there. And alignment is harder in dynamic action, for sure. Right. Okay. Did that solve it for you? It, it did because I'm, I'm very fastidious about the knee, you know, tracking always. It's, it's definitely one of the cues and then pressing down the foot. I just couldn't in my mind figure out, am I telling them to contract glute max? I know that it does contract, but am I supposed to tell them to contract? Or no, is it not really? Anyway. 
No, not really. Because think about it. If the muscle's in a lengthened position in flexion on its way to being extended, they can't contract it anyway. But they can do other things that would be more optimal. Okay, so foot flat on the floor, knee tracked, and focusing yeah. on the and focusing on the lever at the knee first. Yeah. yeah. Which right. would then create yeah, so stabilize that front, you know, the the knee uh, press down on the front foot. So I don't need to. I don't. So you're what you're saying is the glute mat, the glute max can't contract anyway in that position. It's just going to do it when everything else is aligned properly. Uh, as part of its bigger role in dynamic action. It's going to do it naturally as part of its role in dynamic action. Um, the muscle spindles are moving towards each other in glute max as you're moving from hip flexion to hip extension. Yeah. Which by definition means contraction. Right. Okay. Perfect. Yes, you you answered it. As but it can't know. contract while it's lengthened. Right. It right. can just move back towards getting the deck of cards towards each other. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Thank you. Okay. You got it? Okay, yeah. you got it. Yay, you got it. Um. Okay, are we good? Yay, good. Lori's making friends. People are seeing each other. Do you have in-person training? I do have some in-person training. Most of it's online right now, Nan. Um, we even moved our mastery program to an online format, uh, during the world shutdown, which is beautiful. Cause we have people like Anna coming in from, uh, our international, uh, quadrant, but, um, you know what I could do now I can give you my, uh, I don't know if you're asking for this, but I can give you my calendar link. And if you're looking, I'm physically in Cleveland, um, and only, I think two of our current mastery students are in Cleveland. Everybody else is out of town. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. You can, you can get to us wherever you are. No problema. Um, but if you want to talk about some training, man, I'm, I was just going to offer, I'm happy to give you my link just because we are at the top of the, we're at the witching hour on Halloween. We're at the witching hour. So I just want to be respectful of your time. Thank you all for being here. My goodness, nobody even dropped off. Y'all are as excited about this topic as me, which makes me super happy. I love being here with you every week. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing the training with other practitioners and colleagues that you think uh, could benefit. I know many of you told me that you shared the link for the last few weeks. So thank you for that. Um, please do share the love. We all get to rise together. We all get to succeed. There's no competition here because there's more people that need us than there are those of us who serve. So the more we can support each other in being excellent, the more excellent work we do in the world for more people. So thank you for all the work that you do in the world and for up, up leveling our profession. It matters to me a lot. I appreciate all of you. I will see you again next week at noon Eastern. Um, and Nana, I will drop the link for you in a direct email, okay? Thank you so much for being here. See you guys next week. Have a great one.